Trigonometric identities are really just a bunch of formulas that help us manipulate or rewrite different kinds of trig expressions. In this video, we're going to be walking through many of the different types of trig identities. And then I'm going to show you how to remember some of the most important ones and how to derive or prove some of them. We're going to start with the trig functions themselves and then look at reciprocal and quotient identities, Pythagorean identities, even odd and cofunction identities, some difference identities, double and half angle identities, and product to sum and sum to product identities. The thing to remember is that trig identities really aren't anything special. Remember that the trig functions themselves are just defined by the different pieces of a right triangle. And all trig identities are built on trig functions. So really, all trig identities come back to the relationships between the different parts of a right triangle. We wouldn't even really need them at all, but we like to establish these trig identities because there are some kinds of trig expressions that seem to pop up over and over again. And so having these trig identities in place will help us work through those things a lot faster and easier. So if we go back to a right triangle, we have a right angle here, and then we have the angle theta here at the origin. So if we start our discussion with a right triangle, we have this right triangle with a 90 degree angle here, and then the angle theta here sitting at the origin. So speaking of the origin, this right triangle is sitting in an xy coordinate plane. This is the x-axis, and this is the y-axis, which means that if I wanted to find the length of this side of the right triangle that's sitting along the x-axis, I could just call the length of this x. I don't necessarily know what it is because I don't know how big this right triangle is, but I can call this length x since it's sitting along the x-axis. And then the height of the right triangle here could be defined as y because I could figure out how far I have to go up along the y-axis to get this height. So the width of my right triangle is x, the height of it is y, and then I can call the hypotenuse r, which could stand for radius. The reason I think about a radius is because if I were to draw a circle with its center at the origin and passing through this point right here, then that circle, that big circle, would have a radius of r because the edge of the circle would be here, so the radius would be from the origin to the edge of the circle. So I can say x, y, and r. Once I have that basic right triangle, I can quickly set up all six of the circular trig functions. So we all know about sine, cosine, and tangent. And the way that we define sine, cosine, and tangent in relationship to this right triangle is based on this acronym, this mnemonic that we use called SOHCAHTOA. What it says is that in a right triangle, sine of the angle theta is equal to the length of the opposite side divided by the length of the hypotenuse. So I have my angle theta here, and the way that we define the trig functions is we say that sine of this angle theta, so sine of theta, will always be equal to the length of the opposite side, which in this case is y, divided by the length of the hypotenuse, and in this case the hypotenuse is r. So for this right triangle, sine of theta will always be equal to y over r, or opposite over hypotenuse. We always define cosine theta as cosine is equal to the length of the adjacent side divided by the length of the hypotenuse. Well, for my angle theta, the adjacent side is x, and the hypotenuse is r. So cosine is always x over r, or adjacent, over hypotenuse. And then tangent is always opposite over adjacent. So the opposite side from the angle theta is y, the adjacent side is x, so tangent of theta will always be equal to y over x or opposite over adjacent. Now if I can just remember that, if I can just set up my right triangle here in my xy coordinate plane, and remember that the width is x, the height is y, and the hypotenuse is r, and if I can remember SOHCAHTOA to get this far, that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, 
and tangent is opposite over adjacent, then I can start to build out my other three trig functions and many of our trig identities. Because from here, we want to remember the three other trig functions, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. Each of these is the reciprocal of the one across from it. So if we can set up sine, cosine, tangent, and then remember cosecant, secant, and cotangent in that order, these three are the reciprocals of the three in this first column. So if I know that sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, to get cosecant, I just have to flip that upside down, and I know that cosecant is hypotenuse over opposite, or r over y. So I can call this r over y, or hypotenuse over opposite. Same thing here, secant of theta, I just flip cosine upside down. So this is equal to r over x, or hypotenuse over adjacent. And cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, so I can say that it is x over y, or adjacent over opposite. And this is really the foundation for everything. Because from here, I get my first set of trig identities, the reciprocal identities. So remember how we said that cosecant, secant, and cotangent were the reciprocals of sine, cosine, and tangent, respectively? Well, the reciprocal identities tell us that exact same thing. They basically just say that these are all reciprocals of each other. So for example, the reciprocal identity for sine is sine of theta is equal to one over cosecant of theta. And conversely, the reciprocal identity for cosecant of theta is cosecant theta equals one over sine theta. And that should make sense to us because if I, for example, take cosecant theta is equal to hypotenuse over opposite, and I wanna find the reciprocal of that, I would just put one over cosecant theta, and then in order to keep the equation balanced, one over the right-hand side. So I'd get one over cosecant theta is equal to one over hypotenuse over opposite. Well, this one divided by hypotenuse over opposite, when I simplify that, instead of dividing by hypotenuse over opposite, I can multiply by opposite over hypotenuse. So I get one multiplied by opposite over hypotenuse, and the result there is just opposite over hypotenuse. Well, opposite over hypotenuse, we know from here, is equal to sine. So I could actually replace this with sine of theta, and I see here that I've derived the reciprocal identity sine of theta is equal to one over cosecant theta, or what we wrote here. So sine and cosecant are reciprocals of one another. And in the same way, cosine and secant are reciprocals and tangent and cotangent are reciprocals. So my reciprocal identities are cosine theta is one over secant, secant is one over cosine, tangent is one over cotangent, and cotangent is one over tangent. So these are simple enough that we really shouldn't even need to memorize them. As long as we can get to sine, cosine, and tangent from our triangle, and remember that in order to get cosecant, secant, and cotangent, we just flip these upside down, that they're reciprocals of each other, then these reciprocal identities become pretty much intuitive because all they tell us is that in order to get sine, we just flip cosecant upside down, or in order to get cosecant, we just flip sine upside down. So that's all that the reciprocal identities are telling us, and we should really have these memorized or they should be intuitive to us, and we'll be able to use them to manipulate different kinds of trig functions. The next set we wanna talk about are the quotient identities. And these are another set of identities that we should really have memorized. They should feel natural to us. And they come directly from the definitions of the trig functions themselves. So these quotient identities, they're called quotient because we have the quotient or this fraction of trig functions. And we have two identities. Tangent of theta is equal to sine of theta over cosine of theta, or tangent is sine over cosine. 
and cotangent is cosecant divided by secant. Now, this comes directly, like I said, from the definitions of the trig functions. Remember before when we had our right triangle, we knew that sine was equal to opposite over hypotenuse, or y over r, and that cosine was equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, or x over r. So if these two are true, we could plug those in here for sine and cosine, and this fraction right here, sine of theta over cosine theta, would become y over r divided by x over r. Well, if we wanted to simplify this, instead of dividing by x over r, we would multiply by the reciprocal r over x. So we would have y over r multiplied by r over x. And here we would get the r's to cancel from the numerator and denominator, leaving us with just y over x. And if you remember from our right triangle, we saw that y over x was equal to tangent of theta, because tangent of theta was opposite over adjacent, and the opposite side was y and the adjacent side was x. So by definition, tangent of theta is y over x, or opposite over adjacent, but one way we can get y over x is by dividing sine by cosine. So by definition, tangent is always equal to sine divided by cosine. And in the same way, and for the same reasons, cotangent is equal to cosecant over secant. I know that cosecant of theta is r over y, and that secant of theta is r over x. So if I take cosecant divided by secant, instead of dividing by r over x, I multiply by x over r. I get the r's to cancel, and I'm just left with x over y which again is adjacent over opposite, and adjacent over opposite is in fact equal to cotangent of theta. So by definition, cotangent theta is always equal to cosecant theta divided by secant theta. The next one we wanna talk about is Pythagorean identities, and this one also comes directly from our right triangle. The reason we call them Pythagorean identities is because they're based on the Pythagorean theorem which remember tells us that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Well, in that formula, that Pythagorean formula, a and b are the lengths of the two legs of the triangle and c is the length of the hypotenuse. So instead of a, b, and c, if we use x, y, and r respectively, we can say that the Pythagorean theorem for this right triangle in particular is x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. Remember though before when we were looking at our six trig functions, we said that sine of theta was equal to opposite over hypotenuse y over r. Well if we multiply both sides by r, we get r sine theta is equal to y. And that's important because here we have our Pythagorean theorem and we have a value for y, we're going to end up substituting this into y. So we have that value. Remember we said also that cosine of theta, cosine was adjacent over hypotenuse, so that was x over r. And if we multiply both sides by r there, we get r cosine theta is equal to x. Now if we substitute both of these values into our Pythagorean theorem, we know x is r cosine theta, so we get r cosine theta quantity squared, we know y is r sine theta, so we get r sine theta quantity squared, and then we have r squared on the right. When we square both of these, we get r squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta equals r squared. And then when we divide through each term by r squared, we get these three r squared terms to cancel leaving us with just one over here on the right-hand side because r squared divided by r squared is one, it's not zero. So then we get cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one. And this is the first of three Pythagorean identities, but realize that this just came directly from our right triangle. So if we can remember Sokotoa, we can get to sine theta is y over r, and cosine theta is x over r, 
we can solve those for y and x respectively, and then we can plug those into the Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, to get to this Pythagorean identity. So we can either memorize this, or we can just derive it directly from the right triangle. Now there's two more Pythagorean identities that are similar to this first one. You can memorize those as well, but here's a really easy way to remember them or come up with them if you can't memorize them. So what you wanna do is you want to divide through this equation by cosine squared. Then we're gonna get the other identity by dividing through by sine squared. So let's see what happens if we divide this whole thing through by cosine squared. Well, we would get cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta plus sine squared over cosine squared is equal to one over cosine squared theta. Well, cosine squared over cosine squared is one. Remember that sine divided by cosine is the same as tangent. So sine squared divided by cosine squared is gonna be tangent squared. So I'll get tangent squared theta, and then one divided by cosine, remember from our reciprocal identity, one divided by cosine is the same as secant. So one divided by cosine squared will be secant squared. So by dividing the first Pythagorean identity through by cosine squared, we were able to come up with the second Pythagorean identity. To get the third one, we're just gonna divide through this first equation by the other trig function, sine squared. So if we divide this through by sine squared, we'll get cosine squared over sine squared. Well, cosine over sine, remember from the quotient identity, cosine over sine is cotangent. So we'll get cotangent squared theta. Sine squared divided by sine squared is one. And then one divided by sine squared, remember from the reciprocal identity, is cosecant squared. So cosecant squared of theta. And these are all three Pythagorean identities. Now, these are common enough that you may want to memorize these, especially this first one. This one comes up so often that it's really important to have it memorized. These other two, a little bit less so, but they come up often enough that it would be helpful to have all of these available for memory. But if for some reason you forget the second two, you can just use the first one to build them out really quickly like we just did. The next one I wanna talk about is even odd identities. And I don't wanna to spend too much time on this one because there's a pretty easy way to remember these identities. So I would recommend memorizing these ones. But this whole even odd identity concept comes from the concept of even functions and odd functions. So remember that even functions are symmetrical about the y-axis. In other words, if the y-axis is a mirror, the function is perfectly reflected across the y-axis. It has a mirror image of itself flipped across the y-axis, whereas odd functions are symmetrical about the origin. So this whole even-odd identity concept is basically saying which trig functions are even and which trig functions are odd. And the trick I use for remembering this is I just think about this chart in my head. We always arrange the chart of the six trig functions in the same way. You always have sine, cosine, theta down the left, cosecant, secant, cotangent down the right. So in that order, I'm gonna put negative signs in the four corners or here, 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 and here. Because what this is saying is that instead of sine theta, if, or if I have a function sine of theta and I substitute negative theta in for that theta, if I plug in negative theta instead, what do I get back? Well, the result would actually just be negative sine theta. And that's an odd function. These four functions here are all odd functions. And I just think of the four corners as being the odd functions, so my negative signs are gonna be here. Whereas the middle row here, my middle functions, are gonna be even functions, which means that they have no negative sign. So practically speaking, what that means is that, for example, if I'm simplifying a trigonometric expression and I see cosine of negative theta somewhere in that expression, 
that's the same thing as cosine of theta. So I can, instead of writing cosine of negative theta, I can replace that value with cosine of theta, or I could replace secant of negative theta with secant of theta. So that'll really help me in simplifying a trig expression that has a negative angle in it like this. And same thing here, if I saw sine of negative theta in one of my expressions that I'm trying to simplify, I could replace that with negative sine of theta. And either way, notice that the angles here always end up positive. I have positive theta, 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 as opposed to negative theta, negative theta, negative theta. So these are really helpful for simplifying. And all you have to remember is which ones are odd, which ones are even. And I just remember that my four corners are the ones that have the negative sign. So I just put those negative signs out there and that helps me remember the even odd identities. The next set of identities that we wanna talk about are the co-function identities, which are these here. And you'll notice first thing that I've arranged them in terms of sine, cosine, tangent down the left and cosecant, secant, and cotangent down the right, which is of course what we normally do. In the case of co-function identities though, this is an exception where it helps us to arrange this table slightly differently. You'll notice that in the third row here, we have tangent related to cotangent, and then on the other side, cotangent related to tangent. So that's really clean because they make a pair with each other. What we see here is that we have a relationship between sine and cosine, and then down here, a relationship between cosine and sine. Same thing here, cosecant and secant, and then secant and cosecant. So in this case, it actually helps us to move the co-function identity for cosine up to the upper right here and shift down the cosecant identity. So we're actually just flip-flopping cosine and cosecant such that now we have three perfect pairs, sine and cosine completely in the first row, cosecant and secant completely in the second row, and tangent and cotangent completely in the third row. And because these are all matching pairs, these ones are pretty easy to memorize also if we can just remember which ones go with which. This may not help you to remember, but for me, tangent and cotangent always kind of go together. They're both involved in the quotient identities, and they're always on the bottom, so their positions don't change. And then sine and cosine are the two primary trig functions that you always go back to, so to have them paired up is pretty natural. And then cosecant and secant are kind of the leftovers and they go in the middle. And all you have to remember is that you have this pi over two minus theta, and it's gonna be equal to theta on the right-hand side. So tangent, cotangent naturally paired, sine and cosine kind of naturally paired, and then cosecant and secant are the ones that are left over. So that's how I remember the six cofunction identities. But if you can't remember them, you can pretty easily prove them from the right triangle. So here's how you would derive one of these. You have your right triangle, just like we always had before with our angle theta. We have the side lengths x, y, and r. And then if we just call this angle phi, then what we can do is say that if we are looking at the interior angle measures of this triangle, we know that this is a 90 degree angle, but in radians, that's pi over two. So we can say the measure of this is pi over two. And then we know that the interior angle measures of a triangle always add to 180 degrees, or in radians, pi radians. So we could add these three up and they would be equal to pi radians. So that would look like this, theta plus phi plus pi over two is equal to pi. When I subtract pi over two from both sides, I get theta plus phi is equal to pi over two because pi minus pi over two is pi over two. Then I could either solve this for theta or phi. I'll go ahead and solve it for phi by subtracting theta from both sides and I'll get phi is equal to pi over two minus theta. And we'll come back to that in a second. Now remember for these co-function identities, we're taking this first one here as the example. I'm trying to relate sine and cosine to each other. Well, the way to do that in my right triangle is to take sine of one angle and cosine of another angle. So here's what that would look like. If I take sine of the angle phi, remember that sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So I have to do that relative to the angle phi. Well, the opposite side is x and the hypotenuse of the triangle is still always r. The hypotenuse is always opposite 
the 90 degree angle. So sine of phi is x over r. And then if I take cosine of the angle theta, I know that cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, for the angle theta, the adjacent side is x, and the hypotenuse is always r, so x over r. So what I see then is that both of these, sine of phi and cosine of theta, are both equal to x over r. And if they're both equal to x over r, then I know that they're equal to each other. So I can then say that sine of phi is equal to cosine of theta. And remember, I already solved for the fact that phi is equal to pi over 2 minus theta. So I could plug that in for phi, and this would become sine of pi over 2 minus theta is equal to cosine of theta. And you can see how I've proven the first cofunction identity just using the right triangle. And I could use this right triangle to go in and develop the relationships for all of the other five cofunction identities if I wasn't able to remember them. The next set of identities are the sum difference identities, and they're called sum and difference because we're talking about how to take a sum like sine of alpha plus beta, so the sum being alpha plus beta, and expand it into something else, or the difference sine of alpha minus beta and expand it into something different. And these are the three identities that we have for sum difference identities. One is for sine, one cosine, one tangent. Or you could think about there's actually two for each of them because like I said, we have sine of alpha plus beta and sine of alpha minus beta, cosine of alpha plus beta and alpha minus beta, and tangent of alpha plus beta and alpha minus beta. So each of these is actually two identities. And in this first one here, and in fact, in each of them, we've consolidated the formulas for both sine sum difference identities into one formula because we have this plus minus sign here and we have this plus minus sign here. So when you see identities like this or these signs, what it means is that you always use the top sign together and you always use the bottom sign together. So because plus is here on top and plus is here on top, it means that sine of alpha plus beta is equal to sine alpha cosine beta plus cosine alpha sine beta. And because we have the minus sign on the bottom and the minus sign on the bottom, then a separate formula is sine of alpha minus beta equal to sine alpha cos beta minus cos alpha sine beta. You can see here that with the cosine formulas, they're reversed. So when you have cosine of alpha plus beta, the plus signs on the top, you're gonna have the minus sign over here because that's on the top. Or when you have minus because that's on the bottom, you're gonna have plus because that's on the bottom. So there's actually six distinct formulas here. And I just wanna talk about the way to best remember these because proving them or deriving them from scratch is a little bit complicated. It's a proof where you need a triangle and the unit circle and the distance formula and there's a little bit more to it. So I try to remember these, especially because the sum difference identities are the foundation for some others, like double and half angle identities or product to sum and sum to product identities. So if I can remember these or have these memorized, then if I really had to, I could use them to come up with some of the other identities that I might need. So what's the best way to remember these? Well, I try to remember the sine and cosine ones together. And again, this may not work for you. It kind of helps me to remember, especially now that I've gotten in the habit of it. It's the way that I build these from scratch in my head. If you're going to need these on a test, one thing you could do is memorize them, remember them right before the test, review them, and then as soon as you get into the test, on the back of it, write these out so that you can forget them for the rest of the test but still be able to reference them. So the way that I remember this is in a couple of steps. First, I always know that I have sine and cosine. That's typical when I write my trig functions in a table. I always say sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, cotangent. So sine and cosine, that's really natural. And I know that I'm going to have alpha plus or minus beta and alpha plus or minus beta. I can remember that. Then on the right-hand sides, the next thing I do is with the signs. And I always think sine, same. 
So in other words, the sine is the same because I have plus minus here. I'm going to have plus minus here. So sine, same. The sine is the same with the sine function. And then I remember that cosine is opposite that it's different. So I say minus plus because I have plus minus. So it's the opposite. So I think sine, same, and I build that out. And then I know I always have this alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta configuration here. So I just put those in. And now I know that all I need to remember is which trig functions go in these spots. So for me, I just remember that I have sine here on top. So I've got sine first and I'm just starting with sine. So I start with sine. And I remember that this one is a sandwich. So sine is a sandwich. I have sine and sine. My sine functions go on the outside, like the pieces of bread in a sandwich. They're on the outside, which means that my cosine functions have to be in the middle. So I've got sine, sine, cosine, cosine. And then I know that cosine is kind of the opposite way here. My sine and cosine are mixed. I have sine, cosine, and I have cosine, sine. Here in the bottom, I remember that unlike the sine function, my sines are together and my cosines are together. Well, I just wrote my cosines last. Remember, I put in my sines first because sine sandwich, and then I put in my cosines. So I put in my cosines and then I just keep writing cosine because I ended with cosine. So I'm starting with cosine, 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 and then I know sine, sine. So again, that's not necessarily like a trick. It's just how I remember to build out my sine and cosine, some difference identities. And then with tangent, it's just kind of a memorization thing too. I remember that same as these, I have tangent alpha plus minus beta. And then I know on the right-hand side, I'm going to have the same sign on top, which kind of makes sense. Even with this one, it's the same sign on top. And I'm going to have the opposite sign on the bottom. So on the bottom, it's just the opposite. So that kind of makes sense to me. And I know I have tangent. I know I have tangent. It makes sense to me that alpha should go first and beta should go second. They're in that order, A, B, alpha, beta. Alpha's first, beta's second. I know all of my trig functions in here are tangent functions. Same on the bottom. Alpha, beta, alpha's first, beta second. And I know I just have my one here. So again, it's not really a trick. That's just sort of how I remember it. The sign's the same on the top, opposite on the bottom. And then I just put in my tangent alpha, tangent beta, and my one here in the front. So that's how you do your sum difference identities. And these are really important because whenever you have sine of something plus something or sine of something minus something, breaking it apart into this right-hand side where you just have a super clean sine of alpha and cosine of beta, that really does a lot or goes a long way to simplify a trig expression that's complicated like this. We always want to break down our trig expressions so that we have just a simple angle in all of our trig functions instead of this kind of compound angle like we see here. So some difference identities are really helpful when it comes to simplifying trig expressions. These are the double angle identities and half angle identities. And these double angle identities over here on the left can actually be derived directly from the sum difference identities that we just looked at. And then the half angle identities can be derived from these double angle identities. So we're like forming a chain. If we can remember the sum difference, then we can get to these and then if we can get to these, then we can get to these ones. What I would recommend if you can only remember some of these, I would definitely try to memorize sine of two theta, the double angle identity for sine, because this one seems to come up a whole lot. And then cosine of two theta, I would try to remember at least one of these, because if you can get to one of these, for example, if you can only remember cosine squared of theta minus sine squared theta, you can build out these other two from this first one, or you can build out any of these two from the other one, from the third one. So I would try to remember this first one for sine of two theta and this first one for cosine of two theta. They seem to come up 
more than any other of the double angle or half angle identities. But obviously, if you can remember tangent of 2 theta or the half angle identities for sine or cosine, that's really helpful too. Lastly, these are the product to sum and sum to product identities. And the names kind of speak for themselves. The reason we call it product to sum is because we start with a product, the product or the multiplication of sine alpha times sine beta. And we change that into a sum or a difference, but we could still call it a sum because though we have a difference here, cosine alpha minus beta minus cosine alpha plus beta, we could still just call this plus negative cosine alpha plus beta, and then it would be a sum. So we just call it product to sum identities. So we're changing any of these products here into these sums. And then here we're starting with a sum, something like sine of alpha plus sine of beta, and changing it into the product of two trig functions, the product of this sine function and this cosine function. These we can build pretty easily from the sum difference identities that we talked about memorizing earlier. So if you can start with that, you can fairly easily get to these product to sum and then sum to product identities if you need to, or again, you can memorize them. Kind of like before, I have my own sort of tricks for remembering them. These, for example, product to sum identities, I build them out just one step at a time. So like on the left here, I always remember that I start with sine, sine, then cosine, cosine. Sine, cosine is a natural order, and I do the two sines and the two cosines, and then I just have the mixed ones, sine and cosine, then cosine, sine. And I know I have alpha here first always, and beta here second always. So it's pretty easy for me to remember and build out the left-hand side. I know I always have my one half, and I know I always have cosine completely for the first two, and sine completely for the second two. So notice I have cosine, 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 sine, 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 sine. So I fill those in. I know I always have my alpha and then my beta and my alpha and then my beta. So I write those in. And now the only tricky thing really to remember is the signs. All I remember is that I always start with a negative sign. So I do negative, negative, and then I come down here and I write negative, negative. So I start with two negative signs. I end with two negative signs here. And then I know that my other signs are positive, positive. Then I go here to the middle and I know that I had negative signs here on the top and bottom. I know that these other two middle ones are opposite. So those are positive and positive. And then I just remember that I have positives on the left and negatives on the right. So I put in my positive, positive and my negative, negative. And again, that's a lot of steps maybe, but if I build that out a few times, I can remember how to build them that way, and then I quickly have all four of my product to sum identities. So that's what we're talking about when we say trig identities. Those are all of the trig identities, pretty much, in my opinion, in importance from most important to least important, the most important ones being at the beginning of the video. We also covered how you derive or prove a lot of the identities and the tricks that I use for remembering or memorizing as many of the identities as I can. And just remember that these take a lot of practice and the more you use them, the easier they become to remember and the easier it is to identify which ones you should use where. So just spend a lot of time practicing with these if you can, playing around with them, building them out for yourself, and I promise they'll get a lot easier. I hope that video helped you, and if it did, hit that like button, make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.